Okay, got a Bose Solo sound system, TV soundbar. I think goes under your TV and blasts out nice clear sound. They actually work quite well if you've got a, a relative or someone who's got a little bit of a hearing issue. Then the addition of a Bose Solo soundbar to your uh, TV system or their TV system will actually help them understand the dialogue pretty good. Actually, I did it for some people I know. But um, this one has come back from a customer. Well, actually, not a customer. He's a impoverished Bose owner who contacted me and said, can you do anything with this? And they sell, I think about 80 or 90 quid, or well, 90 pounds, 100 dollars, something like that, for the sound bar. Um, second hand on eBay, 75 pounds. Um, and there's a lot of faulty ones about, and I, it's not really worth my while. I do professional audio most of the time, but I do occasionally enjoy looking at the odd bits and pieces to see what could be wrong with them. And this one is dead, and uh, a guy in Germany said, well, look, should I throw it away or should I save it? And I said, well, send it over and I'll have a look at it for you. So this is a free repair for a German customer to, uh, even despite Brexit, we're still cooperating with our German friends. So anyway, so anyway, I received it, and what he didn't tell me was that um, you can see this is the power amplifier stage, class D output stages for the uh, front speakers, and the audio processor stage. You can see there's the audio inputs there, mains input, and of course power supply input filtering, and the power supply under here. So it comes with a cover on the front and the back. There's a cover that goes on the back underneath. And this is one that goes on the top, and I've taken this off and revealed a bit of a horror story. It looks like my German customer hasn't been entirely honest with me. No, he's, um, you can see, if I find something to poke a point with, a pointy thing, this cap, if I tilt that up, can you see that? You probably can't see that there. Let's see if we can focus on it. Or... How's that? But you can see the side of this has all been stoved in by a solder iron and dented. Um, so someone has tried to remove this, the power supply is not working I think. I think they've deduced there's no DC power on this because I've just plugged it in and I'm, there is no DC power. And the DC power, this is the DC reservoir capacitors down here. And I don't know why they put a bunch of low rise ones on but uh, you know maybe it was cheaper than buying two, there's plus or minus voltage rail Maybe it's cheaper than buying two medium sized ones, or maybe they just wanted to fit it in the profile of the unit. I don't know. But um, yeah, and uh, on the back, it looks like it's been down to the local garage. There's a. It's like some sparrow shit soldering on there, and someone's obviously uh, wrenched that apart. And the trouble with these capacitors is if, um, if you don't unsol unsolder them kindly and they don't get too hot and what have you, then. Um, you can strain the leads in them, um, and then you've got a problem. So yeah, there's the can. So I think I'm gonna have to change this capacitor as well. It's looking a little bit bulbous. Right. So if I stuff the power in, and um, we'll do a bit of diagnostics on this and see what we can find out, shall we? Sure, we can't fix it for them. Yes, indeed. Right. So this power, this power here, is comes through a. Variac over the side of the bench, vary the voltage. Behind there is a watt meter, a power meter, so I can see how much the whole system is drawing. So you can tell, hold on a second, that's too much current, turn it off quick, because otherwise something's going to go bang any second. Then the output of the Variac over there goes through an isolating transformer over there, and then over there you can't see it, is, is uh, well, I'll show it to you, I'll, I'll remove it. The live, well actually live and neutral don't have any meaning because it's going through an isolation transformer, but the power goes in through the bulb, through the filament, out again, so that if there is a disastrous short on this board, you don't get things going bang and all the magic smoke coming out, you just get the light bulb lighting up, it's quite a neat trick actually. And then of course when you're really confident that there's no short, you can switch out the light bulb and then run on isolated power, okay? So this uh, power on this connection here, I think I've been through this in the other videos, put the bulb back in for a second. This one is driven by the Variac via an isolation transformer and the light bulb. So if I turn this on like that and I turn it up to 240 volts like that, I can... where's my tweezers? 
or something sharp and metal that I shouldn't really poke in there. Do you know what? Some miserable, ah, there they are. So now I can just poke these in there. I'll take my feet off the floor and poke that in there. And the bulb lights up. Over there, you've got lighting bulbs. We're taking 72 watts and I'm connected to the mains now by my finger. But there's no reference to ground live or neutral. Okay, it's, it's live and neutral is meaningless. I'll show you the bulb, but can you see it lighting up? If I turn that light off, there you go. Now, perhaps you can see me doing it. Doo -doo -doo. You see that light coming on? That's me doing that. So this is safe. So if I, what it does mean is because there's no reference to ground, I can connect my scope probe to the zero volt line of the high voltage side, which would normally be sitting at either mains or neutral. Okay, so because there's no electrical connection, it's connected by the magnetic field of the transformer, live and neutral have no have no um, meaning. And it's the only really safe way to work on power supplies. Stand by to be blasted with light. Yeah, it's the only really good way to work with power supplies, have an isolated supply, then you don't end up um, having nasty shocks. You still can if you get it across your body, but the secret is, this is live, you're working on it, and you've got to work on it with 300 odd volts DC on here, the rectified mains. But as long as you keep one hand away from anything with a metal frame, keep your shoes on, don't stand on a concrete floor, keep one hand there and um, you won't get a shock between you and ground but you could get a shock between obviously live connections plus and minus so one handed job because you don't want to get it across your hands if you get the voltage across your hands it goes through your chest and your heart's in your chest and you know a healthy heart probably survive but I can't I mean I've had loads of main shocks in my time and uh, I survived, but people do get killed by electrical mains, you know, 240 volts DC in the UK. Um, and I've had some pretty sustained and nasty shocks from the electric mains, but it's never killed me. It might have made my hair go curly, but it hasn't killed me. Right, so if I just stuff this in the hue, it's turned off at the moment. My bulb's in circuit, I'll put the mains in. Turn her over. And switch her on, where are we? There we are. Can you see that? Is that in focus? I think it's probably not bad. And what I want is my electrical meter. That's what I really need. Here's to the good old, good old faithful Uni T. This is not my main meter, but um, it's my everyday. Chuck it in the box. Chuck it on the floor. Take it out in the rain. Work on the car. Fantastic meter. Right. Anyway, so yeah. So this is turned on. This is live. It's coming in. The, this power here is to set the variac set to 225 volts. Rectified goes through a filter. Is rectified. Blah 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 through the filter. Probably an inrush thermistor as well, and it ends up on this capacitor which someone has soldered in from a great height. And uh, turn the power on. There we go. What have we got? What have we got on there, boys? We've got. 331 volts right so there's enough dc power to make it huge so it's um it's got power is there any dc now remember these said that the dc capacitors are surface mount capacitors on the other side of the board so let's just flip her over carefully by you can see here look i mean you guys are probably electrically minded anyway but this is the high voltage area okay so this is a no-go area this is a shocking area this is the low voltage and logic. There's a DSP behind there. There's the audio amplifier chips. All this runs on DC. So it's the power is comes from the high voltage side via the induced flux and the uh, flux in this transformer. So this is running at probably 50 kilohertz or something like that. And the flux comes through there, through that rectifier diode there, into this low voltage DC smoothing capacitor so if there's any voltage any power getting to this thing on the other on the secondary side you can see there's a heavy track and what do they do they, they put they transmit the power to the other side through a load of vias that's a real no-no any of my engineers had done that when I was a technical director I would have um, called everybody over and ridiculed them yes my management style wasn't great but it was effective right so there you go on there look what we got 
we got now on the secondary. So the question is, why isn't it working? Why haven't we got any power coming out the secondary of this thing? Uh, answers on a postcard. Um, I, know, I know why it is, I think. Right, okay, so if I just flip her over again, what you've got, actually, no, on this side, let's just talk about this side for a minute. We've got the um, couple of capacitors. I think all the power is driven through those capacitors. There's two uh, 7N60 uh, power FETs, insulated gate power FETs. They're switching the primary of this transformer. And they're driven through, because this is an universal input, i.e. it goes from 90 to 240. If this was like a 240 volt only device, you wouldn't really need a bridge or a half bridge, but you do need a half bridge for higher power. Power supplies working on lower voltages. And generally speaking, they're more efficient. This is our, that thing there, a fan 7384. Yeah, that's a half bridge uh, FET drive chip. And there must be some management somewhere. No management in there, you know, that's just a driver. So it's got to be this one here, that's a 337R21-1. Special Bose secret chip, hey? And my guess is it's one of those two is blown. I know the FETs aren't blown. Generally, if the FETs are blown, then you've got an overcurrent condition, and we don't have that. The thing's taking four watts, which is probably partially reactive current because of the uh, it's just feeding through the bridge rectifier, through a bit of filtering into that... Uh, big reservoir capacitor okay and there is a dropper for the this thing is supported by a bootstrap so until the bootstrap supply comes up ie driven by the flux and transformer there's 105 105 that's um uh, is that one meg resistor that's a yeah that can't be right can it that can't be enough for a bootstrap supply let's see what we've got on there there's a naught volts, I think. Is that naught volts? Yeah, we don't short these out now. Yeah, 335, so that's the, that's the high voltage size naught volts. And so on here we've got... That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I see what they've done. Yeah, that isn't connected to there. It's a scratch on the board, looks like a track, so that's not connected to there. So we've got 83 volts on there. So my guess, it's one or more of these, and there's a couple of, I think there's a, probably, if it's a typical circuit, there's a, this, and then two Darlington drivers driving the gates of the FETs. You need a, quite a powerful low impedance drive signal for the FETs to dump the gate charge to make the FET switch on and off quickly, which means, uh, which gives you uh, much more efficient. The only, the only um, dissipate power when they're switching, if you think they're fully switched on, they're a few hundred milliohms and switched off, they are um, effectively infinite uh, as far as the current consumption is concerned. The only time these uh, FETs are dissipating is during the switching edges. So the faster you make the switching edges, the less dissipation in the device you've got, and also more efficient the power supply. The downside is, if it, the faster you make the edges, the higher the actual um, component frequencies of the square wave. So the faster the edge, the higher the frequency interference you get in terms of radiated power coupling to the atmosphere or the magnet electromagnetic field and that's what these cans are about is stopping that field from radiating and then interfering with your radios and your that radio and anything else that's working on radio wi-fi and so on um yeah so my guess is it's these two chips um I'm not even bothered to get the data sheet out for these. The first thing I'm going to do is save my time is change these two chips and see whether she springs back into life. If she doesn't, I will investigate further. But for sake of a couple of dollars or a couple of pounds or a couple of euros, um, I might as well just change them. And if the thing's been stressed out anyway, I found actually as a matter of um, practice is that when I haven't changed enough of the components in the power supply, you do get this issue where it can fail again and so it's good practice to change most of the semiconductors in the power supply so I think what I'm going to do is get something plastic to poke it with if it's still switched on is to uh, change this chip, this chip and the two transistors on the other side 
then I'm going to meter around these to make sure that these none of these driver transistors are shorted and then I'm going to put the power back on and see if she works and if she works job done but I thought you might find that interesting so do you want to watch me changing the chips I guess you do okay well let me um let me just sort them out then I'll go to the rack and get a couple and then we'll swap them out and we'll see how we get on shall we the capacitor that <laughs> someone's like, I'll fix it for you don't worry I'll fix it and I've seen so many of those that have just been completely buggered up by people poking around shorting things out it's untrue. true so yeah a little bit of knowledge is a bad thing anyway look um there's the back of that nasty capacitor and across there is um, 350 volts at the moment so I've turned the power off and I'm just going to connect a load resistor across just to short it out, it always makes me jump okay so that was a... Uh, how many ohms is that? Ooh, 10 ohm resistor so if you put it, a wire across it it's not really good for the capacitor to have a massive power dump but you imagine the peak current when you first touch it would be about 30 amps through that resistor but yeah, so now we are in a safe mode where there's nothing on that capacitor. Well, four volts. But you know, if you start poking around and there's voltage on that, then it's not good. It is not good at all. So let's turn on the hot air gun. Fire up the old dolly. And uh, somewhere here, I'm probably not the most organized person in the world second most organized person in the world, not the most organized, so there are oh, little bastards that need changing, pardon my French. That's a bit wobbly isn't it, let's just, let's just wedge something under there just to give it a bit of stability. Hold on a minute, that's no good. How about the tube of heat sink compound? Oh yeah, just right, there you go. I'm good, but oh. Focus, so I'm going to lock the focus on that because otherwise you're going to be going all over the place spot the focus spot the focus right okay well hopefully I, I'm not sure about this camera so in this tube which is now going to be more look at the size of that it's just a small syringe that gives you an idea of this, the scale of things Ooh. okay so I'm just going to put this is Kingbo flux which is a surface mount flux used for BGA type ball grid array type chips but you just put a little bit on, you don't need very much, you don't need, certainly don't need that much. I'll, uh, I'll just get my trusty brush and spread it around a bit. Okay, so there we are. It makes all the difference, it just makes life so much easier if you've got some decent uh, flux on it. Wash it off with isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol afterwards and then everybody's happy. But um, yeah, look at that. It's all splodgy, isn't it? Um, so there's nothing around here really which is going to really suffer from the hot air. If there was a small tantalum capacitor, for example, or aluminium can capacitors, they don't really like getting heated up, and you either have to remove them first or put a bit of tin foil over the top just to shield them from the hot blast of air. So what do I do with my new components? That's a good question. They were here a minute ago. There they are. Right, so noting that um, they have got pin 1 on the board, so we know which way, so we don't have to really worry about that now. Are we still lined up? Yes, we are. No, we're not. So, guys, this is heat. Hot air. Everything's turned off. Just double check. A bit of smoke coming up there. I don't know if you can see that. It's not magic smoke, it's fluxy smoke. Can you see how nice and sealed all that is? And I can see these ones on this side have melted already, but not the other side. So just be patient and waft it around. Whew. Nope, still too much. Still not molten. Come on, baby. You can do it. This is when my wife walks in and says, oh, You're going to open the window, you're going to die. No, I won't pass me another cigarette. There we go. So that's a bomb. Ooh, yeah. Oops. Come on. 
Come on, Betty. This is, uh, I think it's uh, 10 or 15 thou lead pitch on this one. It's the Magic Bose Power Supply chip, they don't tell anyone what it is. You have to be in the Bose Brotherhood, which I'm not, definitely not. Yeah, sometimes you have to apply heat for a bit longer because there might be, you can't see it, but there's this is a multi-layer board, so there could be copper tracks inside, uh, sucking all, drawing all the heat away. So sometimes, I'm just going to hit the switch on my soldering iron. Sometimes, if it won't go, there's no point in just cooking the board forever. You could turn the temperature up of the blast, but um, the air blast, but not really worth it. So what you can do, but she's she's stubborn, isn't she? Uh, there we go. She's come off. All right. So did I just? I nearly displaced that capacitor, but I didn't. Just put him back on. There you go. So you can see the chips are down and gone. Right. So. What we've got on there at the moment is nasty um, leaded, unleaded solder. Bear in mind this is a you know, recent production item. Shouldn't be going in the skip just yet, should it? Let's face it. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's the nasty unleaded solder, which is not so easy to work with, and it's got a higher melting point. So the first thing we want to do really. Is if it's a domestic repair, and as I'm not charging for this one, it's not chargeable, so I'm going to replace that solder with. I'm going to wipe my tip. Nothing like having a dirty, smelly tip, is there? Uh, so yeah, I'm going to remove that solder. And I'm going to replace it with some nice 6040 tin lead solder. So use a bit of solder braid and Hoover, Hoover it up. I don't know how it's just sort of like um soldering blocking paper. You've never used solder braid before, you don't know what you've been missing. It's really good fun. There you go, so I've hoovered that up and I'm going to hoover this up. Don't get it stuck on there. If you pull it, it'll pull the tracks off. You have been warned, right? Is my head in the screen? Can you see my head? See, it's pretty big. Right, okay, hold on. Uh, what are we doing now? I know. Yeah, so that's that. So, a little dash of the old I say propanol, Let's give it a good wash. Gently brushy brushy. There you go. Get rid of the old flux and the old detritus that's built up and it was solder beads and what have you. So we've got a nice clean oh, starting point for this. And now what we do is apply a bit more flux. Fluxing hell. Right, along there. Oh. We do. There we go. Some flux on there, and then some flux on there. Can you see that dog hair on the end? We've got a golden retriever poodle cross, and that's one of Delilah's hairs. They're everywhere. Every product I ship back to customers got at least one free dog hair in it. Right. Okay. So uh, now, what do we do? We turn the temperature on solar line down to something like 330. Okay. We'll pull this wire out of the way. Right, this is a Weller uh, 60 watt temperature controlled soldering iron. Very good, actually. It's got this just this, um, there's a heating element up to there, and that last bit is just the hot tip. So the heat goes from the air there to the tip. So it's, it's pretty good at regulating it. I've, um, I enjoy using these. So my blower's still blowing, so I'm still pumping out hot air, which is nothing unusual. And uh, so I'm just going to apply some solder to these pads for when we reflow the chip back on. In fact, we could do a manual solder on that one, couldn't we? Now, yeah, I'm going to show you a manual solder on there. I should show you a manual way of changing it, shouldn't I? On this one you can't really, but you can, but you need a magnifier to do it. See that? Can you see that? Can you see the solder? Now, without that, without any flux on there, you definitely have a bridging issue. But there's no because you've got flux on there. Just trying to get the right amount of solder on them. 
there we go. All right, nah, let's reflirt. Should we reflirt? Yeah, let's reflirt. I'll show you a manual one some other time. I can't be bothered tonight. It's after hours working, this is, you know. It's all for British German relations. He has fixed it when the local German engineer couldn't fix it. What is happening? Right, okay, so uh, that's that bit. You're getting bored yet. You can always fast forward to the end if you don't like this bit. Tweezers, chip. Uh, a little bit of flux on my chip leggies just to make sure that they just take the chip and give her a bit of flux. There we are. That's terrible camion shit. No, it's only me here, you know. Right, okay. So she's done. Right, so we pop her there. You have to remember to have your device nearby so it gets preheated a little bit. If you dump it on the pads, it'll just freeze them. It'll be frozen. Right, so pin one, spin her around. So the pin one, and we're going to plonk that one on there, right? Okay. So I'm going to have to do this left handed for a right handed person. This is beyond the call of duty. Ready? Can you see? Yeah, it's all in focus, so here we go. Yeah, you can see that. Can you see it changing colour there? Where, um, where the lead and is sold is just that much easier to melt. Look at that, they're all melted now. All melty melty. I think they are. Yeah, they are. Except for those ones on the end, because they're on a bigger copper track. So let's drop it on. But, uh, you have to be like a bit like um, a plate spin or something. You have to regulate the position of this thing to keep the temperature correct. There you go, so that's soldered, yep. Now the other one, take it, uh, where's my brush with the flux on? Can't do everything on screen I'm afraid guys, or girls. Be a really good old laugh at my antics. Right, here we go. So, pin one, where is pin one of this thing? There we are, there's pin one. Right, apply some heat. Get my head out of the screen, looking for the colour change on all the pins, got it. Right, so drop that on. Come on, behave yourself. Just a little bit high up there. Come on, come on. No, too far. Come on. What is that the light? Is that in line? No, uh, overcooking it now. There we go. Now that needs to come down a bit, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right, here we go. Just about enough to keep it molten. And push it down. Tie your mother down. Yeah, lovely. That's a lovely job. Now what I'm going to do next is clean it off. Clean it, clean it off. With the old jollet. There we go. Give it a good old brush over. Yeah, be careful if you um, have this stuff on the board and then you turn it on and something blows up because um, you should clean that up as well. Let's just tidy up that solder joint by Hans Soldering Anderson. There we go. Horrible bloody job that is, just over there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, if you have the IPA on it and then you turn the board on and the board's still wet and there's a spark because if something's not happy, you can. Um, it can be fairly entertaining because it catches fire. Spark. So it's always best to make sure your board isn't highly inflammable before you turn the power on. Alright, so let's just put a little bit of solder back on there and then we'll clean them up. You know, a lot of people that work on these things that have been soldering for years don't have the unleaded uh, temperature soldering iron. And it, to, it, to unsolder a 
If you've got a, an ordinary soldering iron designed, designed for leaded components, it runs at much lower temperature and it can be a real devil of a job to actually melt the solder all the way through the board and pull components out. It can be a real devil if you haven't got the right soldering iron. So the trouble is that some of these boards have got plated through holes so the internal layers of boards make connection to the actual walls of those holes which are plated in after the boards have been sandwiched together. And um, yeah, if you, if, you, um, if you start getting that grief, those little, they can fracture and you end up with the plated through walls of the hole not being connected to the, uh, to the internal layer so the PCB is no longer wired correctly. And I see that quite a lot actually, of components that have been manhandled by someone. So let's give a little bit of heat to the alcohol. It's getting quite heady in here actually. Smoke and alcohol. Sounds a good combination. Probably not good for you though. Looks like my eyeglass has been used as a spittoon. Can't can't reveal the condition of my eyeglass on online. There'll be shouts of horror. Right, okay, so let's have a quick look, see what we've got. Always inspect your joints, then light them. Can you see? Can you see that at all? Oh, you can. Look at that. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was good. Those two in the middle are a spark gap. You see where they've cut a slot in the board? That's to stop any sparks jumping across from the high to low voltage size. This chip derives the voltage for driving the high side of the half bridge is derived from the power supply, so it can be um, floating about all over the place. There must be an isolated drive circuit inside this chip. And then this one. Yeah, I think that's all right, don't you? I don't think the old um, macro zoom will zoom in on that anymore. I think we're on maximum chooch on that. Let's try it. No, it won't go any more than that. It won't go any more than that. But I think that's okay. So uh, I'm going to just double check with a real close up look. So excuse me a moment. I'm just going to uncheck that, make sure it's all right. Yeah, so that's absolutely fine. So we've changed the two chips, chip one and chip two, mystery Bose chip, and uh, yeah, so how's that? You can see that, can't you? right? Actually, these two, these um, video repairs are just the same as the normal repairs I do, but they haven't got any swearing in them, right? Or shouting. So should we put the power on and see what happens? Let's see what happens. Ready? Contact. Oh right, now we've got, uh, it's taking an extra six, eight watts. Could that be a good sign? Or could it not be a good sign? So where are my low voltage capacitors on this thing? They're on the other side, aren't they? So making sure there's nothing metallic on the bench, I'm just going to carefully grab this and turn it over because it is live at the moment. There we are. And can you see the meter? Yes, you can. Well, almost. Apart from a bit of a glare there. And what have we got? What have we got? Have we got any power? Nope, still not working. So what could possibly be wrong with it? Yeah, there's power there, but I don't think she's switching. Okay, so we've ruled out those chips because they're now correctly fitted. So the next stage is to. This goes to show that when you've had a board that's been mucked about with some by somebody, have a look at this. Have a look at this. How am I supposed to fix that? I can fix it, and of course I can, but um, wait a minute, have a look at this. I'm going to zoom in now. Yeah, remember what I was saying about not having boards that have been worked on by other engineers, so-called engineers. Look, 
Look, look, they've snap, snipped off the, the driver transistor. That's very unfriendly. I'm not happy about that. It means I've got to find out what that transistor is, because as you know, Bose never issue any circuit diagrams. So I've got to go and take another one apart and find out what that transistor number is, and then find one and put it on the board. But not happy, German customer, not happy. So I'm going to put that on, and then if it doesn't work, we'll start poking around in more detail. But at least we've ruled out, we've saved some time by ruling out these two little, these two little, where are they? Where have they gone? These two little jommies here. So they're going to end up in the component graveyard, regardless of whether they're any good or not. But we still haven't got a resolution at the moment. We may have fixed the original problem, but someone snipped out my bloody transistor. So I'm not happy. Okay, after poking around on the internet, there are no circuit diagrams for this uh, Bose Solo Sandbar Controller Stroke Amplifier Power Supply. Um, so I forced to get the old, um, put my reverse engineering cap on. And this, by look of it, should be an MPN transistor. And it's used, I think, to put the power supply into a, a high efficiency mode. There are standards for modern equipment whereby in standby they're only allowed to produce or sorry consume very small amounts of power and this is quite, uh, quite a hefty power supply because this has got quite a lot of um, audio output so there's a lot of power required so in quiescent mode these take if you, it's just running and there's no sound coming out it's taking something like 10 watts which is not good. So this transistor is used to control the switching circuitry to provide a very small current um, for the electronics to run the um, IR receiver and to wake the processor up and to turn the power on. So it's something like 400 volts um, and to be safe, 400 volts between the collector and the emitter and to be safe I'd say double that up to 800 volts and clearly it's not a very big package so it's um, probably just going to be a, like a 1 watt or 2 watt transistor. There are very few um, easily readily available components that meet that specification. So I've had to order some so I won't be doing this repair or completing it until the parts come in tomorrow. Right, time to remove the what's left of the transistor that someone kindly snipped out of situ. A uh, little bit of flux on the old brush, and away we go. Yeah, so the transistor that I managed to get has got sort of um, the voltage and the current gain or HFE that we're looking for is actually somewhat larger than the one that used to be in here. Um, there are transistors available with the right sort of characteristics, but um, well, not available, but they are manufactured but they're not mainstream um, and so consequently they're not covered by distributors consequently it's virtually impossible to get hold of them unless you want to buy thousands of them buy reels of them and then you have to wait weeks and weeks so really um, let's put a bit of leaded solder on there that will make it flow a little bit better and it's coming out here so I'll give this one a a quick sucking and then we're ready to stick the old transistor in. It is a bit oversized but I bought the one with the higher current gain rather than some of them are dreadfully low like current gain, gain of 10 whereas this has got typical 40 which I think is probably about right for the circuitry. One. Go through. Two. Hello. I think that's all the suckers defunct. And then... Uh, oh, let's buy it. Okay. Right, see if my legs will go through there. Nobody likes fat legs, but this one's got quite fat legs on it, so... <clears throat> we'll see, won't we? Let's get a bit of clean, get rid of all the bubbles. Cleanliness is next to godliness. 
although I wouldn't recommend getting isopropyl alcohol in your private, so I've done that once, a bottle fell over on my lap when I was filling it and it slipped out my hand and drenched my trousers and I'll, I'll tell you what, it's like that alcohol rub stuff, it just gets pretty hot pretty quickly and uh, yeah, not fun, so I don't do that. Right, where's this transistor? Where's it gone? There he is. So that's the one I'm putting back in, this thing here. You can see his legs are a bit fatty, fat legs, and I think... Uh... Okay, the transistor is in. Replaced. Okay, so the new transistor is soldered in, its legs all twisted, but separated. So the legs aren't together. It's much bigger than the old device, but it has to be lying down because of the um, profile of the can that goes on the top, stops it standing up. But it's, it's, it's plugged in the right way around. Um, what have I got? Oh yeah, uh, got this. Can you see that? That's connected to the uh, scope probe um, ground, or zero volts. Remember it's going through an isolation transformer. So uh, mains is in through the isolation transformer. So let's just turn her on and see what she does. Um, yeah, we should be able to see it start up, shouldn't we? Let's have a go at that. Some idea. Okie dokie. Let's hold that there so you can see it. I'll put the scope probe next to the transformer. There'll be enough flux probably to couple to that without actually making electrical contact. So here we go. Gonna make contact now. contact power on oh yeah look so that's drawing 11 watts now it's powered up properly look 18 watts that's taking so the transformer is chooching that's the waveform at uh, how many kilohertz is it uh, 72 kilohertz is power supply well there you go that's a reasonable size square wave um, yeah so there's power there so if I just um, see what happens. Is that going to stay up? It is. But bear in mind that the um, IR receiver for the remote control is not plugged in at the moment so the behaviour of this thing might be a bit unpredictable without the rest of its systems present. But there is flux there so the next thing we'll do we'll just check the, um, the voltage on the DC side to see what voltage we've got produced in the uh, secondary side, the low voltage side that drives the amplifiers. So if I just grab my meter, move this out of the way because I don't really want to make that. It will make contact, but there are some high voltages, so you have to be a bit careful with the scope, really. You don't want too much going down the, the input pipe, otherwise it can spoil its day. Um, here we go, so power on, we're on 200 volts DC, that should be alright. There you, you can see that, can't you? Yes, you can. And uh, yeah, I was wrong about this power supply, I think. I think there is only a single rail. Is it working, though? Question Have we got anything at all? Yeah, okay, so we've got power. That's 23.7 volts DC on that capacitor. Yeah, I think they're all in parallel, actually, because. Yeah, they're all grounded, so that's a single supply rail. I was wrong, it's not a split supply rail. A lot of the bow stuff has two supply rails for the amplifiers, but these are clearly get enough oomph from 23.7 volts. Um, um, what I'm going to do is just connect my electronic load, which I've got up there, which um, allows me to put some DC load on this just to make sure the power supply can hold up under a load condition. Because sometimes um, when it's quiescent and idling, there's no drive to the speakers. You can get a voltage on here, but if this is not regulating properly, as soon as you start to draw power, the voltage goes all over the place, so you haven't got regulation. So the next thing is just quickly solder a couple of wires on to the load, and then just check the regulation. So I'm just going to rig for that, and I'll come back. I do this to all power supplies that are repaired, because you need to know that they can um, pack the punch that they're required to, to drive the unit. Otherwise, when the customer turns the volume up, the whole thing breaks down again. And if the regulation's not right, then... Um, yeah, it isn't going to work properly. So we'll just check that next. 
So that's the wavelength you get when the power supply is idling at low power mode. Um, when you first kick, kick, switch it on, put the power on, it does that for a couple of seconds, then goes into the full, full mode as the micro wakes up and powers up the amplifiers. Then after maybe five minutes, it reverts back to this where it shuts the amplifiers down and goes into the low power state. So it's in standby at the moment, but there is still 23 volts on the capacitors. And if you just, uh, if I just slow the time base down on this thing, oh, that's the gain, wrong one. There we go. Let's turn it there. Slow the time base down. You can see other kicks happening. There's the regulation going on, keeping the 23.5 volts. And it just needs a bit of power just to keep the thing running in standby and and, and also to um, make sure it meets European uh, standards on standby power consumption because there are strict standards on how much power you're allowed to consume when an item is not being used on standby. So there it is, it's the power supply is working. I'll do the load test but um, I just need to then to determine what else needs to be done to make it work. Okay, so we've got the power lines. This is just the tw plus the 0 volts DC low voltage side and the 23 volt DC up to this meter up here. And you can see the obviously you know the scope on the right, and it's still running at 72 kilohertz. That probe is just near the transformer; it's picking up the flux, radiated flux. Um, and on this this thing here is a programmable load. It's, it goes up to 150 watts. It's very good. I've got one that uh, 151 watt and a I've got a um, 1.5 kilowatt one as well. They're very good for testing big power supplies. And yeah, so at the moment we're in constant current mode, CC. The bottom uh, display is displaying watts, I think. And the top display is the voltage. So we've got 23.76. So by turning this knob, I can increase the load voltage and it will keep the voltage the same and increase the current. So it's a con it's a acts as a constant current load. So let's just see what this thing can uh, deliver, shall we? So let's just turn it on. Right, it's drawing a, uh, When it's on, the off light is off, off rather than the on light on. Don't know why. Chinese. Next, they always put the bloody um, terminals around the other way. You've got the red on the left and the black on the right. So have to be careful with that, because all the Western equipment's not that. So I turn the current up. You can see the top... Now I'm taking 4, 5, 6 milliamps. 10 milliamps and so on. You can see the current going up and up on that. Now we're at 20 milliamps, so let's just move the digit over a bit more so we can move it up a bit quicker. One more. So we're, we're, we're stepping up our 150 milliamps steps now. So if I just go like that and reduce it to 100 milliamps again. There you go. And then move it back to there so I can do 100 milliamps at a time. So... Yeah, does that work out, the maths there? It's got amps there instead of watts. So view, watts. Nope. Oh, I had it on watts a minute ago. So the one's the set current and the other one's the wattage. But what we're not seeing is the actual voltage. So I'd like to have the voltage and the watts, please. Constant current and watts. Set, the SV means set value rather than voltage, guys, so that's 100 milliamps. All right, well, um, let's just do a quick run-up to make sure the voltage regulation. So I'm going to put the view back to volts, and I'm going to wrap the current up. So we're, we're pulling an amp out of it now, and then we're pulling 2 amps, which is over 40 watts. So, oh, it's shut down. So you can see it's it's over, gone over current now. Can you see it trying to start up and say, hold on a minute, you're taking too much of my power. So if I just turn this down, again, it'll fire up. There you go. So she's recovered. So the limit is 2 amps. So whatever it says on the package about being 80 watts or 100 watts, RMS, it can't even provide 40 watts. I think probably about 35 watts was the, the limit there. And I was driving it hard. So if I just um, just show you this, and when I draw the power of the current, if I switch this back to the, the wattage view, you can watch the watts and the current. So the top indicators the current bottom ones the watts and just watch this watch this is the transformer waveform this is the active part providing the power we're taking at the moment which is the quiescent current of the unit is about 10 watts now i'm not drawing any power through the load that's just the electronics and the amplifiers and you can see this area is the active area so as i increase the power you'll see that get wider and wider as it's driving more and more flux into the transformer to sustain the secondary voltage so watch this 200 milliamps 
So we're up to 11 watts. We're up to 21 watts. Can you see it getting wider? See that? Can you see that? I'll zoom in, watch. There you go. So we're running, we're drawing 37 watts now at 1.6 amps. 40 watts, 42. Place your bets. What's she going to fold at? 50 watts. There you go, 47 watts. So yeah, there's plenty of power there. And bear in mind, I'm drawing that constantly in the DC load, where you know audio would be booming and peaking and cresting, and a lot of the power sort of in those capacitors would be dumped out through the uh, through the through the speakers. So I'm going to call that a repair. I reckon. I don't reckon there's much else to do to that apart from just test it. But in my experience, this half is if this half fails, that half there, which you can't really see, I'm moving my spoke probe, still switched on. It's a little bit warm. These fail, they usually go dead short, short as um, these things. Class D, nasty class D, loads of distortion. No one seems to mind these days. And it's goes to show um, what a clever speaker enclosure can do and filtering and stuff. Um, yeah, so it's a repair, so I hope you enjoyed watching that. If you've got one, then the advice is change the semiconductors in the power supply. And... Uh, Probably um, just get everything a really close and, and close visual inspection. It's surprising what you can find just by looking at stuff. But once more, you know, if you're doing anything with this at home, if I've encouraged you to take the cover off, then you're doing it at your own risk because um, you know there are lethal voltages, and if you don't have the right setup. It could be quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But if you're an engineer and you just want some pointers and you're happy to work on medium high voltage equipment you know you know the risks then please carry on but i hope you enjoyed that watching magic smoke and maybe someone will find this useful i don't know but anyway cheers